Okay, uh, welcome everyone, everyone back uh, to the One World Mind seminar, um, our last one of 2021. Um, today, we're very happy to have uh, Emily King from Colorado State University. Um, Emily is an assistant professor there at Colorado State in the Department of Mathematics, uh, where she's been since 2019. Um, prior to that, she was a professor at the University of Bremen in Germany. Um, at both uh, Colorado State and at Bremen, Emily has led the computational data analysis group. Um, and prior to those positions, uh, she did some postdoctoral work in Germany, uh, for which she was awarded the Humboldt uh, Research Fellowship. And uh, going back even further, once upon a time, she and I were graduate students together at the University of Maryland, um, and even during an RU program at Texas A&M. Uh, Emily has done a lot of uh, interesting work in the mathematical community. She is co-organizer of the Codex online seminar, um, and she's also developed uh, an online game, uh, the game of Sloan's, which is a game for finding uh, optimal packings, which even has like an online leaderboard. Um, her research interests include pure and applied harmonic analysis, data analysis, uh, frame theory, and signal and image processing. And uh, today she's going to talk about uh, different types of mathematical analyses of neural networks. Um, so Emily, uh, welcome to the One World Mind Seminar. We're very pleased to have you and we're looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you uh, to all the organizers for the invitation and to Matt for that nice introduction. Um, so speaking of the fact that, that Matt and I share an advisor, uh, a friend of mine, uh, when he saw the title of this talk, teased me a little bit because I gave a talk on something completely different earlier this year and also used the word potpourri, um, which was actually, it's a, it's a favorite word of our, uh, Matt's and my shared advisor. Um, and uh, so it's just gonna be a mixture of a, of a bunch of different things. That's like my go-to word when I can't think of a, a more clever way to, to tie things together. Um, I do have to say that when I was invited to, to give this talk, I asked for the end of the semester, I mean, in part because Thursdays are really bad during uh, class time, but also because I was really hoping to get uh, another result and uh, the semester just kind of killed me. So um, this, this new exciting result that I was hoping for is not yet there, but um, maybe stay tuned uh, in the future. So um, big question. How and why do neural networks work? Obviously, this is a hugely broad question. Um, and it's something that uh, we, like many of the talks here in this very seminar uh, address. And um, what's really neat about where we are today is that, you know, in the past, it's like, there's this creature that's crawling around or these cells in a body. And so the biologists go in and figure out why are these things doing what they're doing? Or, you know, there's these observations in a telescope and the physicists are figuring out why are these objects far away getting doing what they're doing. Um, and with deep learning and, and neural networks and machine learning, it's kind of like we now as mathematicians uh, are able to act like the biologists, act like the physicists, and we get to try to understand why these creatures that are out in the wild, like why they, they do what they do. So another sort of question that goes back to the really, really fundamentals of modeling, which was, you know, what can we do to prevent overfitting? Um, obviously, things like, you know, deep neural networks, there's a you know, great potential to overfit. So there's a lot of different things that have been, um, you know, created to, to prevent this overfitting. Uh, and here I have these two images that I just took from Wikipedia. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have what was probably everyone here in this talks. Um, very first introduction to the concept of overfitting, right? You had, so maybe intro stat instructor draws a set of uh, points in the in R2 where the X coordinates are all different and then kind of ask you how, what's the best thing to fit. And of course we know that if all the X coordinates are different we can always fit a, a polynomial to these that fit perfectly. But of course this polynomial is garbage as, as, as a model because if we have you know, an input, an X value of like minus 0.4, we would not expect the, you know, the output value to be something around 12. We would expect it to be somewhere around, I don't know, in the, you know, minus seven to minus 12 range. Uh, 
Um, and so this is like our, the first thing we learn. And then, you know, we get into more machine learning tasks and then we have something like, oh, these blue dots are vital measurements for, um, you know, something like someone, uh, cancerous cells that are going to, that are pre-metastatic. And then the red ones are, uh, you know, certain measurements of, of cancer cells that, that are not going to become metastatic. Uh, and then you want to know, well, if I have these measurements beforehand, um, can I predict whether or not something's going to be metastatic? And so we want to be able to draw a boundary. Um, but obviously, if we make the boundary perfectly fit the date, trading data, then again, we get something that's garbage because, for example, if we have something that's right between these two blue dots, it's going to be classified as red. Um, and then um, one of my favorite slides, as soon as I saw this uh, uh, picture once in a talk, I knew I had to steal it. Um, so the question is like, how can one train neural networks in a way that mimics nature? So we don't necessarily need to do this, right? But um, there are some, some nice inspiration that we can take. So it ends up that, a newborn, that newborns have approximately 50 trillion synapses. So these sort of connections, um, if we think of it as matrices, is non-zero entries in a matrix. And then one-year-olds have about a thousand trillion synapses. And then adolescents have uh, about half that many. Now it's easy here to make the joke, especially seeing how many undergrads have been acting during the pandemic to say, well, that's just because high schoolers are not as smart as one-year-olds. But of course the maybe kinder interpretation of that is that perhaps the brain is overtraining and then sort of pruning back once it figures out what is actually important and simplifying these things. So today in the talk, there'll be a very, very baby introduction to neural networks that I'm guessing everyone in the room is probably very well aware of, but I just wanna make sure that the talk is reasonably self-contained, um, especially since it will be posted later. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the singular value decomposition. Uh, so it's been kind of my quest over the last couple of years. I've be become uh, sort of proselytizing for this decomposition. Uh, because it's, I think, far too often ignored in intro linear algebra courses, and I think that should be something that's really highly prioritized. Uh, and then finally, we'll get to the little potpourri of some of these techniques uh, for understanding neural networks. And is there a question in the chat? Okay. All right, so basic question, what is a neural network? Uh, so a neural network, we just fix some sort of nonlinear function, um, usually from R to R that we call an activation function. So there might be something like a softmax or, or, or some other type of nonlinear function that's, that's applied at the end that's not component-wise, but we're going to be focusing on this, this component-wise function. Okay, component-wise, so I use that word component-wise, why, why do we have components? So a layer of a neural network is just defined by two fundamental objects from linear algebra, a matrix and a vector. So we have the inputs from the previous layer, which we are going to label as a vector x, j minus one, and it has n, j minus one entries. And we multiply it by this matrix, a sub j, which is called a weight matrix. Uh, and then we add a vector to that b sub j, which is called the bias. And then we apply this nonlinear function component wise. And that is what a layer is. And a feed for old neural network is just the composition of these layers. So the, the secret sauce is really this, this injection of nonlinearity, but these um, linear algebraic objects that are just inserted in every single layer, I mean, these are the things that are being trained when we're training a neural network. So we can use a lot of tricks and tools from linear algebra to try to understand these objects better. So in particular, if we take what are the number of inputs um, at the very beginning of the neural network in not, and what are the number of the outputs at the very end in L, then we can just uh, consider any network uh, with L layers just to be a function from these two different Euclidean spaces. So some broad categories of how to mathematically analyze neural networks, and this is certainly not complete, but just a couple of different broad categories. So one is, as mentioned before, we can view a neural network as just a function between two different Euclidean spaces. So one of the things that we can do, and we will do later in this talk, is just to analyze 
uh, entire networks just as functions. They're functions in some sort of function spaces and what sort of properties do they have? Another thing we can do is we can kind of zoom in and look at every particular layer and sort of analyze as a function what happens um, just at the layer level. And finally, and this is sort of less rigorous, but oftentimes inspired by um, rigorous mathematical methods, is to analyze certain properties of real data sets as they travel through the network. So we have something from a real data set is our x sub naught, that initial vector that's being fed in. Um, and then what are the properties of that as it travels through? Uh, so first, I want to introduce uh, the most common activation function, uh, which is the rectified linear unit. And the rectified linear unit just says, hey, is this component a non-negative number? Then we keep it. If, is this component a negative number? Then we change it to zero. So there's a lot of things that's nice about ReLU. The fact that it's turning a lot of things to zero in part is kind of helping overfitting. Um, but it's also something that's a sort of tractable type of, uh, of function. Um, and it's also nearly linear. Well, nearly linear in one sense. Well, it's piecewise linear. Um, it's also non-negatively homogeneous. So if we multiply any input by a non-negative number, then we can pull that scalar out. And then we have this sort of, so we don't actually, it's not actually a linear function. We don't have additivity, but we have this like sub subtractivity. So, uh, this, this minus sign here is important, but if we take the difference of um, the ReLU applied to two different vectors in the same dimensional space and take the norm of that, that is bounded above um, by the, those distance, uh, the norm distance of those vectors in the higher dimensional space. So here's a, a, a diagram of showing how it's like very, very much not linear. So what we're doing here is this uh, set S, this is a set of just the set of blue points. So they're just the, the points lying around the unit circle in R2. And then we just multiply them by some matrix. So here it's the matrix zero, one, one, minus one. And what we end up getting is this tilted ellipse that's still centered at the origin. Uh, and so now just uh, for visualization sake, things have shifted down. So here we have the origin in the center, origin in the center, um, now in this, this furthest right-hand diagram, the origin is the lower left-hand corner. Uh, and so what we see when we apply ReLU component-wise to this tilted ellipse is we get this little arc here, which is the same, it's just what was in the first quadrant. And then we get these tendrils here. So, so these lines aren't plots of the axes, they're actually like tendrils of the everything that was in the second, third, and fourth quadrants being projected on to the X and Y axes. Um, and so this is a this geometrically is is pretty weird. So this really shows how the nonlinearity really comes into play. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a detour um, so I can proselytize uh, why you should be teaching uh, SVD and interlinear algebra, um, but it's also going to come back a little bit later in one of these techniques uh, to understand, try to understand neural networks. So as a little review, what is the singular value decomposition? So if we have any matrix A that's M by N, then we know that it can be factored as a product of three matrices, U, S, and V, where U and V are unitary. Uh, U is M by M, V is N by N, and S is a diagonal matrix with the same number of rows and columns as A. And the diagonal entries are non-increasing and non-negative. And these entries are called the singular values. Uh, and so even though statisticians hate doing it this way, for me, when I'm doing things like principal component analysis, I stack my data vectors into a short fat matrix rather than tall skinny matrix. So here, uh, my matrix S is going to look a lot like this. So it's just going to have these, these values on the diagonal and then a bunch of zeros. Um, so we have this theorem that I keep adding names on because I keep finding out that there's you know, more ways that this theorem has appeared um, in the literature over the years. So I call it the schmidt eckhart young mirsky theorem. I think a lot of times people will just use the latter three names. Uh, but basically what it says is you can use a singular value decomposition to very easily um, 
construct a best rank K approximation of a matrix. So take a, a singular value decomposition of our matrix A, and all you're going to do is you're going to keep your unitary matrices U and V, and then on that diagonal matrix, you are only going to keep the first K singular values and you'll zero out all the rest uh, and multiply these things together. So this matrix is the solution to two different optimization problems. Um, one is that you want to best approximate your A uh, in the Frobenius norm with a matrix that has rank at most K. And the other is you want to best approximate A in the spectral norm with rank at most K. So kind of anything that's like a matrix norm that involves twos, uh, basically this is going to be your best bet. And this really, this theorem is like the powerhouse of how principal component analysis works, where we assume that our data lie in a, you know, maybe possibly affine subspace, we center the data, we perform the singular value decomposition, and then we have the large singular values correspond to the directions of the data. So here um, with this data set, this um, long arrow here is what the first column of that U matrix is multiplied by the first singular value sigma one. So it shows how important it is. That's the trend of the data. And then here, this tiny little vector here that's perpendicular is the second column of the U matrix multiplied by the second singular value. And then you can uncenter the data. So one comment I wanna make is that a lot of times linear regression is used when it should not be used because linear regression has some sort of assumption of, of a dependence. Um, whereas principal component analysis does not. So principal component analysis should take the place of linear regression in a lot of places that linear regression comes up. Um, but of course, not all data is approximately affine. Um, so it, this is, this is, this is a, a method that can be used to define other methods and can be a good inspiration, but it's also something that's pretty easy to perform. And so I wanna give an example of something from Many years ago, it was actually a short period of time between um, my doctoral degree and when I moved to Germany, I had a postdoc at NIH. Um, and so we are working with uh, clinicians from the National Eye Institute, um, trying to work on quantifying um, macular pigment and other things in eyes uh, to see if we could um, help better understand progression of age-related macular degeneration uh, which is the leading cause of blindness in persons of European descent. So what we had is we got these data stacks um, of images of the retina of people um, who were suffering from age-related macular degeneration. So that's what these like little lesions are, um, excited under different wavelengths. So we had a very large data set of the same person and their retina being excited, uh, four different photos under the same wavelength. Um, and so we just did the most basic thing to start out with. Um, there's no reason to assume there's going to be any linearity to data, but uh, we kind of registered the data. So we made sure that the photos are perfectly aligned. Uh, and then we just did principal component analysis. So we had four different images. Um, and what we're looking at right here are the first and the second principal components. So the first principal component looks a lot like an image. In fact, um, if you compare it to what just the average of the images the stack was, it's, it's very, very close to the average. So it's just a nice, clear, sharp image. Now, what we see here in the second principal component is something that when we showed this to the clinicians at the National Eye Institute, the uh, woman who was in charge, the medical physicist who was in charge of taking these pictures kind of like almost like fell out of her chair because She's looking at these pictures all day long and there is this thing that she could like sense was happening in the pictures, but she couldn't like put it to words. And it ends up every second component of like every stack for every different patient spat out this something with this sort of these shadows and these patterns. So sometimes even when you don't think the data might be amenable to using principal component analysis, sometimes you can be surprised at what comes out. And we actually were able to use this pattern that we found um, and correct for it when doing our analyses. Okay, so um, hopefully I've convinced you that this is uh, something that should not be uh, forgotten in intro linear algebra because I know in my intro linear algebra class we covered a lot, but we did not do singular value decomposition. Um, but now we're going to sort of pivot a little bit and I want to reformulate uh, what happens when you're computing singular values because we're gonna need it a little later in the talk. 
So we're going to rewrite the singular value um, decomposition or the composition, the way to compute the singular values as a min-max problem, which min-max problems are kind of gross, uh, but this will be useful later. So let's let script B be the unit ball. Then with just a little bit of mild trickery from linear algebra um, and knowledge about what norms are, you can see that the k singular value is just what happens if you take the u and the v from your singular value decomposition of your matrix, um, and then you have a diagonal matrix in the middle, but now you've zeroed out all the first k minus one singular values, and you take the spectral norm of that. Um, well, that's just the same as taking a minus the best at most rank k minus one approximation. Um, and then you just use, oh, well, this is what is the definition of the spectral norm? So we're taking the two norm uh, with the product of these matrices times uh, elements of the unit ball, and we maximize the unit ball. And then we look at, well, what is this a k minus one? This was something that was a minimizer of a best rank um, at most k minus one approximation to A. And so now what we've done is we said the kth singular value is a min-max problem. We're minimizing over all matrices B with rank at most K minus one, and we're maximizing over the unit ball over the two norm of A times the element of the unit ball mi minus B times the element of the unit ball. So keep that kind of in the back of your mind for a couple of slides. Okay, so now what we're going to get to, this is the, the potpourri. So a couple of different um, directions and methods at mathematically analyzing neural networks. Okay, so let's go back to this picture of, you know, the evidence of sort of the, the brains and, and humans developing humans overtraining and then sort of pruning back. Uh, and now let's go back to that min-max problem. So we recall that that k singular value we can write as a min-max problem where we're minimizing over all matrices of a certain bounded rank and we're maximizing over all points in the unit ball. Um, so what we can do is we can define these sort of singular values for a ReLU layer um, as a min-max problem that looks almost exactly the same except where we just slap on some component-wise ReLU. So we define S sub k uh, rather than the sigma sub k to be the minimum over all um, matrices L with rank at most k minus one um, and the maximum over all X that are in the unit ball. And then we take the two norm of the difference of the uh, ReLU uh, component wise on AX minus ReLU component wise on LX. And, and if you remember, we had that bound before that this, this ReLU function is um, sub subtractive basically. Um, and so we can always see that these SKs are going to be bounded above by um, the singular values. So the we're calling ReLU singular values are bounded above by the actual singular values of our matrix A. And the observation is that trained ReLU layers have implicitly lower rank than their weight matrix would seem to indicate. And we can use this for pruning. Let's see that there's a question. So it says, if you centered all the I images, why would the first component still be the average I image? Uh, okay, so let me go back to this real fast before we, we get to this other question. Um, so here with these I images, we were um, doing sort of principal component analysis. So we centered them down. So the averages were zero. We computed the singular values and then we shifted them back up. So, um, so that's why that this is looking kind of like that. Okay, cool. Any other questions before I move on? Oh, quick question. Uh, um, is this, when you say observation, is this an empirical or a, a, a provable observation? Yes, this is super <laughs> empirical um, and something that I am sweeping under the rug, or a couple of things. Um, one is it's not right right now that it's not super tractable to actually compute what these singular values are. So what we have is we have code to like approximate them um, and we could prove like bounds on them. But um, yeah, I what what follows in this this initial section is is more empirical. I should also mention I have this little parenthetical comment here. 
Um, so the, the few proofs that there are um, in this particular paper involving these Rayleigh singular values are kind of of this, this thing that I have just defined for you. Um, however, what we are going to look at when we discuss actual trains, um, layers in a network is a different variant because if you think about it, um, if you're maximizing over points in a unit ball, that's kind of silly because you're not putting arbitrary data into a neural network. So if you want something that's sort of maybe interpretable, you maybe want to say what's happening when you put in real data and try to maximize over like real data, not data that's coming from a unit ball, which has no like meaning when it comes to like, um, you know, pictures of cats and dogs and airplanes and cars are not, you know, looking like they just are an arbitrary vector from the unit ball. So there, there are two different versions and I'll kind of lay out what they are in the next two slides, whether or not it's this sort of more mathy version or a version that also takes into account the bias of the layer so that not just AX, but AX plus B, um, and then you maximize over the training data. Further questions? Yes. Yeah, so it's not a typo. We The synapses do decrease. So baby goes up to one year old and then decreases. Okay. So this uh, these plots are actually coming from the more quote unquote mathier version where you're um, actually looking at, um, uh, you're actually uh, evaluating over points in the unit ball. So what we have here, because these are evaluating matrices that aren't from a trained neural network, they're just random matrices with a certain structure. Um, so each of these uh, four plots represents uh, singular values of matrices that are IID, um, four by four IID matrices that where the distributions are different for each of the different plots. Um, and so this is just their four by four. So they have four singular values. And so the, the solid lines are the plots of the singular values, the like actual singular values, the matrices. And the dash line is the numerically computed upper bounds of these singular values. So we see even in these sort of um, arbitrary sorts of, of matrices, not ones that are actually from a trained neural network, we're seeing that um, implicitly they can be really well approximated by matrices that have lower rank than the actual matrix has, which makes sense because really was just throwing out certain information. So you kind of think, you get something that's sort of aligned to the negative things that are being thrown out, then it makes sense that you could maybe approximate with a lower rank matrix. So what was then done was using this leveraging this to do a, a sort of pruning and, and basically be that, go from that one-year-old to the teenager and kind of get rid of some excess things that are not necessary. Um, and a very basic way is uh, there's this entire thing with double layers, but, but the key idea is to try to enforce layers to have a uh, lower rank and um, do that after you've done training. So you train a network and then you go through and you, you, you're looking for, okay, which layer can I decrease the rank uh, while decreasing the accuracy the least? Um, and then sort of enforce that decreased rank um, and then retrain for some batches when you, you reach a certain um, criteria and repeat. So what we'll see here are some plots of um, doing this to two different train networks. Um, so the top network is trained on CIFAR 10. So this is the still relatively simple classes of, you know, you've got the 10 different classes like cat and dog and, and boat, and you're trying to classify them. So what we're looking at here is as we move from left and the lower one is MNIST. So as we move from left to right in both of these plots, we're taking a network that's been trained and then we're just doing this harmonic pruning. So we're enforcing lower rank, lower rank, lower rank, lower rank. Um, and we just keep squeezing that out. And so what we're seeing in the both the black lines is what is the accuracy on the test set? Um, and if you look for both plots, you could do a lot of squeezing out of the rank until you start noticing a change in the accuracy. 
So MNIST, we you know expect that's going to be very high accuracy to begin with, and you can squeeze a whole lot out before it starts dropping. Uh, CFAR 10, this was a, a relatively simple, um, just you know, three layer uh, network. So the um, we didn't have a super high accuracy to begin with, but we were still able to squeeze out without changing the accuracy of the train network. And then what we see in the different colors is, so in this, this process, you're looking for where's the best place to cut rank, where's the best place to cut rank. Um, and so that's gonna be affecting different layers at different times. And so we can like look at the different ranks. So the red with the circle is the rank of layer one. Um, the green with no marker is the rank of layer two and the blue with the blue uh, diamond is the rank of layer three. So we sort of see in both of them, this uh, layer three is like not touched the beginning because that has a bigger impact, but you can you start squeezing out things from this initial layer um, and then the second layer and it's only later that suddenly you've squeezed out enough of the first layers that you can start squeezing out rank the third layer. Okay. Uh, Emily, so yeah. just a quick mm -hmm. clarifying question. What's the what's the horizontal axis again? Like okay, you... so this is a somewhat <laughs> I guess this is a little bit poorly uh, visualized, but um, so the numbers for the horizontal axis um, correspond to like uh, percents. So in the case of the black with the square, then that's the actual percent of the um, accuracy in the test set. So it's like one type of percent. Um, for the ranks, it's just saying we're starting with the matrix being 100% the rank it was before we did the pruning. Um, so they're both percents, but they're sort of different kinds of percents, if that makes sense. Yes, okay, yeah. thanks. So this flat line here, for example, at the beginning says um, this rank, of the layer three, it's 100% of what it was when we started. So it's not changed at all for these first like 30 iterations or the lower one is not changed at all for the first like 80 iterations. Good question. I don't think anyone else has like picked up on that before. Okay, so let's move on to another um, little nugget in our potpourri um, and it's just using Gaussian mean width. So I think there's a number of people in the audience who have done a lot with, um, you know, compressed sensing and high dimensional geometry. So this is just a tool that is well known in, in the community. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, it's this formula kind of belies the simplicity of it. And the basic idea is you have some sort of data set. Um, you can think about it as a discrete set. Um, but it ends up that the Gaussian mean width is going to be the same if you take the convex hull. So we can here in this diagram, it's sort of drawn as a blob. Um, and the basic idea is you spin up a vector. Uh, and then once that vector is spun up, that gives you a direction. And you slide that vector around inside your data set. And you say, where is the data set the widest? And you look at that width and you record it. And now you take the expected value over some distribution. So with the Gaussian mean width, the way that you're spinning up your vector is as um, IID with you know standard normal. And you can also do things, there's uniform mean width is another one that's commonly used and you use a uniform distribution. And it's one way to sort of measure the complexity or dimensionality of your data. So this is another sort of heuristic uh, look into neural networks. Um, and now let me explain what these two different plots mean. So again, we're looking at two different plots where we're playing the same game in two different kinds of networks. So one uh, are networks and they're the same architecture for both, but one was trained to classify data from the HTRU2 a data set, which is concerning identifying pulse star stars. And then on the right-hand side, you know, the the very, very basic MNIST, so you're identifying hand um, drawn digits. So what we're looking at here is as we move from left to right, we are training the networks more and more. And uh, so that's the X axis. We move from bottom to top, so the Y axis, this is actually the Gaussian mean width. So bigger numbers means there's bigger, you know, kind of sort of spread. 
And now we look at the, the different colors. So the red diamonds is corresponding to layer one, the blue, uh, the green circle to layer two, and the blue pentagon to layer three. Um, so here's here's what we did. We took um, randomly sampled uh, elements of the data set, and we took um, one randomly sampled set of this of one size of data that the network was correctly classifying, and then took another randomly sampled set of, of the same size of data that the network was incorrectly classifying, and then pushed one of the data sets through the network and said, okay, after uh, the first layer, what's the Gaussian mean width? After the second layer, what's the Gaussian mean width? After the third layer, what's the Gaussian mean width? And did the same thing for the other data set. And so what we see here is the, um, the solid lines represent the Gaussian mean width as the correctly classified data set travels through the network and the dashed lines is the incorrectly classified. So in both of these cases, what you can see, and there's this is just a sampling of, of two of the different networks. This is something that was noticed in, in the other types of networks we trained, but that the correctly classified data, all the data gets pushed in a some sense, the Gaussian mean width is increasing as you go through the network. Um, but also the correctly classified data is the Gaussian mean width explodes a lot more than the incorrectly classified data. So in all of these, the solid line is above the dashed line, um, except for layer one, layer one, it's pretty much indistinguishable between the two of them. But as you push it through, and one interpretation is, well, the stuff that's correctly classified, like the network knows what to do with it. So it's sort of pushing these things out so that when you actually get it to the classifier, um, then it's able to do its job because the things have been sort of teased apart from each other. So um, I'd had a, at one point a bachelor's student sort of work um, on applying this to some other networks. And um, so what we're looking at here is a very similar type of plot. Um, but it's with a fairly simple convolutional neural network. Um, so a convolutional neural network is just something where instead of a normal matrix multiplication, you're basically doing um, something that is a convolutional um, operator in at least some of the layers. So what we have here is um, these layers um, that are kind of in the middle of these plots are layers that these are where we're do there the convolutions are happening um, and then this these purple layers that are on top are the so-called fully connected layers so the sort of um, standard we're just learning a general weight matrix without like a whole lot of structure as assumed um, and so there's at least some evidence and this again is from a bachelor's project but that um, you know this doesn't happen with convolutions, but as soon as you sort of leave the, the convolutional layers, you get to the fully connected layers, then we see this sort of trend with the, um, the Gaussian mean width showing the correctly classified spreading more than the incorrectly classified. Um, which again, I think makes um, sense because you know the convolutional layers you can think of are like pulling out features rather than like kind of pushing things away. Um, so I, it, it does make some sense, although I think a lot more work uh, needs to be done to try to really understand what's going on. Okay, so now moving on to the third fragrance uh, piece class of things in this, this potpourri. Uh, and we're gonna start off with universal approximation theorem. So this is just a huge class um, of, of theorems and kind of, kicked off by Subinko and Hornick, and um, many, many people have done lots and lots uh, since then, and I'm not an expert in these kind of theorems. Um, but the, the basic idea is that you fix some epsilon greater than zero, um, and when you're given some activation function, so remember that's the nonlinear part of a neural network, that's in some function class, and you have some function that's in some other function class, um, and you want to approximate that function f uh, with a neural network that uses that activation function. Um, and these universal approximation theorems said, yes, there's gonna be a neural network with that activation function that approximate f uh, with an epsilon to some norm. But there 
typically allowing there to be some sort of explosion, like they could be arbitrarily wide, meaning that you're sort of taking whatever your input in. So if your function f is like a function from the real line to the real line, then you have like a layer in between where that real line could be mapped to r to the 10 million and then back to r. Um, and you'd have no bound on what those, those uh, the sizes of the, the dimension of the sort of inner meaning um, spaces that you're being mapped to or the arbiter or they have arbitrary depth so you're not putting a limit on how many different layers there are. So this is, you know, very interesting. But you know, when you're typically when you're training a neural network, you fix an architecture, meaning you say there are going to be this many layers, and you know the layers are going to have this many um, be mapping from R of uh, this dimension to R of this dimension. So you know, what about spaces of networks with thick architecture? And this is certainly not a new idea, um, even as early as, you know, one year after uh, the publication of some of the original universal approximation theorems, people had already started to ask these sorts of questions. And um, so this first paper, this Jurassic Progio, is concerning um, activation functions with the sigmoid, which is something that was sort of common back uh, in the day when it was more thought about, like, in making your neural network be like a brain. Um, and then some of these other ones in between are concerning using a heavy side function as an activation function. Um, and then the, these next ones that listed that are with um, Philip Peterson and co-authors, this is really an inspiration for what the, this, this last section of the talk is about. Um, so first, just a little hand wavy definition of Sobolev spaces. Got a question here. So the question is a well calibrated neural network shield. Yes, um, confident class probabilities on incorrectly classified data, which correspond to more similar logic. So could this be used to explain the lower Gaussian mean width for incorrectly classified data? It's possible. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, one of the drawbacks of the Gaussian mean with uh, the, the work that has been done up to now on this is we're, we're looking at Gaussian mean width of like things that we know are incorrectly classified and things that we know that aren't. So um, it would be interesting to sort of look at what happens like if you have a mixed class, if there's some way that you can leverage this um, to understand these things and if that is somehow related to the less competent class probabilities. Um, okay, so moving on to Sobolev spaces. Uh, Sobolev spaces are just kind of nice subspaces of LP, basically. So um, we're looking at some sort of domain omega. And um, I'm saying it's nice. I mean, normally you're talking about open uh, sets here. Uh, we're actually, most of our proofs are like uh, using things that are sort of uh, boxes with, with non empty domains. And um, so we're going to fix some P. And I want to point out here, these it, this excludes P is equal to infinity, which definitely in other papers as well causes some, some issues. Um, so the, the Sobolev space, uh, K and P, are all the functions that are in LP over this domain omega, such that the all of the um, partial derivatives up to order k um, exist and are also in LP of the same domain. And k is this order. And we can define a norm by just sort of adding up LP norms on these different derivatives of this up to this bounded order. Um, and that gives us a norm that makes us a Bonac space. So it's if you let k equals 0, you get LP. And so LP is the sort of uh, one type of Sobolev space. And we're going to be building to other types. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, um, we're going to fix an architecture. So by that, I mean, we're going to fix our activation function um, and we're going to fix our number of layers and we're gonna fix the number of neurons in each layer. So we're gonna fix uh, what dimension of uh, Euclidean space we're mapping to um, between each layer. And so we're spitting things in and I'll point out here that on this, just to make sure it's clear, 
Um, on this last layer, we're not putting an activation function on. So we're just doing like affine linear, nonlinear, affine linear, nonlinear, da 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 da. And then the last step is always going to be this, this affine linear. So we have uh, the set of all, sorry, I. Here, that is the, this one is actually involving um, the activation function. Anyways, but, but what we're looking at is we're saying, if we have this architecture, um, and then if we, for that architecture, we choose what are all the possible entries for a matrix, uh, all the weight matrices and all the bias vectors. Um, so we choose one choice for weight matrices and bias vectors, that gives us one function. And now we look at another choice that gives another function. So what we have is we have a collection of functions that are going from omega to R of LN, where LN is the, the size of the output. Um, then for a uh, compact omega, we with non-empty interior, then this space of functions is not closed in the space of continuous functions um, with respect to the soup norm for almost all um, activation functions, but ReLU. So ReLU has a little special thing. Um, it's not closed in LP for arbitrary P, where I'm saying arbitrary P uh, less than infinity. And it's also not closed in any Sobolev space where P is arbitrary and K is dependent on our activation function. So these first two results are from the papers with Peterson, Roslan, and Voiklander. And then this, this last result is a result of co-authors and I. So let me say a little bit more about what this means, k dependent on rho. So first of all, p uh, can't, at least the proofs as they are, don't work for p equals to infinity, but probably there is some way to get around that. So how is this k dependent on rho? Well, if we have an activation function that is m times differentiable, but not m plus one times, um, and all the derivatives satisfy our locally p-integral and bounded on compact sets, then this space of functions of realizations of the neural networks are not closed in the um, Sobolev space of order at most at m minus one. And if we put a little bit more, uh, we assume a bit more, if we assume that this um, nth derivative is absolutely continuous and okay, it's not m plus one times differentiable, but the weak m plus one derivative, m plus first derivative exists and is an LP, then we actually get something much stronger than that space is not closed in the Sobolev space of order m. So in some of the, one of the earlier papers by um, um, Peterson and Roslan and Feuchlander, they had suggested that it was possible that, you know, because there's more structure um, in the Sobolev spaces that these spaces might actually, these neural network spaces might be closed um, in Sobolev spaces. And it does not, yeah, it's, that's definitely not the case, at least when uh, P is not infinity. Um, and finally, if we have a real analytic activation function that satisfies certain hypotheses, then the space of realized um, neural networks with the same um, architecture is not closed in any Sobolev space. Um, so let's just do quick time, maybe a little bit of time to kind of sketch one of the proof. So in all of these different proofs, there are, um, it kind of relies on um, explicitly building sequences of neural networks with the same architecture that you prove converge to something that is not something that can be exactly represented by a neural no a network of that architecture. Um, so this was the general idea of, of these papers, um, the, the peterson roslan Voiklander, although they were looking at different sequences of neural networks that were converging to different types of, of things. Um, okay, so what we're gonna show here is, or sketch here, is that if we have a, an activation function that is um, continuously m times, but not m plus one times differentiable, and the derivatives are in um, LP lock intersect uh, L infinity, then um, any of these spaces of neural networks are not going to be closed in the Sobolev uh, space of order m minus one with p anything except for infinity. And the, the very basic idea is we just define a sequence of networks that converge in Sobolev norm to the derivative of rho, derivative of our activation function, um, which we know then can't be um, actually uh, represented by it. 
And so due to this nesting of network spaces, we can actually, um, we can actually do this on a much simpler example because we can always make uh, elements of a matrix uh, zero. Um, and so we can prove this for a very, very simple architecture that has um, one node for most of the layers and then two for one. Uh, and so the basic idea is we first build up a network that um, um, starts with whatever number of entries we want coming in and then is every other layer just has ones. Um, and we can make that where it blows up. We always can blow up our um, domain so that it encompasses some sort of interval from minus D to D. Um, and then we compose a sequence of networks that are very short. So they have one, two, and then one node that we're gonna compose with J. So we're gonna take this network J that we have that sort of blows up the domain and we're gonna take that blown up domain and we're gonna fit, feed it into this, these other networks and that's gonna spit out our goal. Um, and the weight and bias matrices for this, for uh, so for the layer that's going from one to two, we have a weight matrix of uh, just one, one and a bias vector of one over n zero. And then for the layer that's going from two to one, we have a um, weight matrix that's uh, n minus n and bias vector that's zero. And do the shortness of time, not gonna go into the details, but it's not too hard to see that what you end up getting is that you are you're basically getting something that's gonna approximate this, um, this activation function. And you have to use a little bit of trickery to make sure that it is uh, approximating, that convergence is in Sobolev norm, um, but it's, not, it's, it's nothing that's beyond sort of like basic real analysis. Okay, so um, you might ask a question, well, what happens if I play the same game, but, uh, we've sort of fixing an architecture, we're fixing an activation function, um, but now we're saying that we don't want the weights or the bias vectors to explode in entries. So we're just saying we're going to have something, let's call it some um, M and none of the weights or uh, weight matrix or bias vector entries can, can go above that M. Um, and then we look at that space of realizations and networks, and it ends up in that space is closed and all of the different spaces just talked about. So continuous spaces with soup norm, LP, P arbitrary. Um, so again, the P arbitrary means not uh, infinity um, and Sobolev spaces where in this case, regardless uh, of the activation function, we, we have it for arbitrary order. But what this says is whenever we approximate a non-realizable function um, in the closure, then we have to have exploding weights. And maybe a quick comment here, why do we want, um, why is non-closeness actually good well, it, it speaks to the expressibility of a neural network. So if a neural network can approximate something really well that it can't actually express exactly, that is a good sign that there's like this expressive nature of neural networks. So what this is saying is if we wanna do this expressive nature, um, then we have to realize that we're gonna have things exploding. Um, but we know neural networks work in a lot of situations. So can we realistically um, train a network to approximate non-realizable functions? Um, and for the sake of time, I'll say uh, we, you know, heuristically kind of showed what, what was happening is that uh, we were training networks to approximate functions that we knew um, we are provable to not be representable by that architecture. Um, and we were still able to get good approximations. Um, and what we sort of saw was that the, the maximum entry of the, the weight matrices and the bias vectors was, was growing, but it almost like a logarithmic type of growth. Uh, and so um, ended up that inspired a sort of proof that ended up not being not too hard that says, um, if you take rho to be pretty much any common activation functions, but the ReLU type ones, um, then you have some sequence of uh, networks uh, with certain mild restrictions of architecture that will approximate that derivative in LP norm um, and, uh, that is bounded, uh, that approximation is bounded by, by some constant that depends on P, but not N. Um, so you're basically, you can get this sort of bounded growth. So you know that if to get perfect uh, approximation, things are going off to infinity, but you can sort of control that growth. So um, some questions is we can use Gaussian mean width or generalized singular values to help us characterize networks with less linear activation functions or different sorts of goals. 
Um, can they be leveraged to improve networks against for tax? Uh, what about the topology uh, and other function spaces, for, for example, P equals infinity? And um, what are the closures? So this is a hard problem, um, but what is the closure of a particular neural network space? And this definitely would tell us a lot about the expressivity. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, and thank Matt for plugging the Codex seminar. I'm gonna plug it again at the end. Uh, so it tends to be a little more on the, well, there's more theory, but um, also some applications of harmonic analysis, combinatorics and algebra. Um, and then the two main papers that uh, were touched on today are in this slide. And I see there's a question, um, slide 35. Was it 35 that you wanted to see again? Oh, so there's another question of, uh, maybe you can get different results if you only compute the Gaussian mean width on samples of the same class. And that is a really good point and something that's kind of a, some future plans. So thank you for that question. Well, um, thanks, Emily. I'll just say thanks <laughs> for the great talk. Um, and indeed, uh, now we can, if there's other questions, of course, uh, I, I suppose Emily would be happy to answer them. Um, if you'd like to drop them in the chat, uh, that's or, or the Q&A, excuse me, that would be great. Or you can raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you. Of course, if you have talking permissions, feel free to unmute yourself and simply ask. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll add uh, one or two in here while maybe people are collecting any additional thoughts. Um, actually, since there were some questions on the Gauss, Gaussian mean width already, maybe I'll ask that follow-up question for now. Um, have, are you familiar with this neural collapse phenomenon? Yes. <laughs> so okay, another plug, we've any... got a talk on neural collapse up on the Codex uh, YouTube oh, uh, yes, channel. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Um, uh, yes. But I, it's. I, just, I forgot about that. Yes. Well, do you have any comments then on how your Gaussian mean width results relate to the neural collapse phenomenon? Oh, that's a good. That's a really good question. So, for for those who aren't familiar with neural collapse, um, it's it's basically this idea of like extreme overtraining. Um. So, like, past the point where. Um, you know, everything in the training set is 100% correctly classified into the point where the actual loss function itself that you're using to train becomes like the error becomes zero. And then what, you know, was noticed was that the like vectors that are in the sort of final weight matrix of the network, they end up spreading out to become this like something called a simplex equilinear type frame. That's like, you know, this really pretty geometric object. Um, and uh, yeah, but no, I hadn't thought about uh, kind of seeing what the Gaussian mean with does in that, in these sort of, uh, those sorts of very, very overtrained networks. Um, that would be really interesting because they're still obviously not um, hitting things perfectly. Um, yeah, there's still a lot that, that confuses me about the neural clocks, like, especially, like, I don't know if you, how much you've looked at the ImageNet data set, but they're really into dogs. So like 10% of the classes are different dog breeds. And some of them are so similar. Like, I feel like you would have to be like an expert in dog breeds to differentiate them. Like there's two different types of Swiss mountain dogs. One that's actually called Swiss mountain dog. One's called some, something else. And apparently one is like much bigger than the other. So if you knew the size, you could differentiate them, but based on the pictures they look, I, I can't tell the difference. And so it's, it's a little brain breaking to me that those two classes are like pushed as a part as like the dog in like a swimsuit and then you're still getting better results. So like, um, it's really cool. And, but I still just don't understand like the, how it's, how it's actually working. But I think the Gaussian mean width is a cool idea. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, those are some good comments. And um, yeah, yeah, thanks for the answer there. Um, questions from, from other folks? Um, I'll stop the recording now as well. <laughs>